So I've had um, Star Wars on the mind a lot lately. I've been trying to play the old Republic MMO, uh, which is pretty good as far as MMOs go. And I've been reading the book Darth Plagueis. So when I'm done that, I'll probably do character profiles on Palpatine and Plagueis because they're both fascinating characters. Maybe I'll do a review of the whole book because it's excellent. So this is a video um, I get requests kind of indirectly for from time to time. It's a topic a lot of people have fights about on uh, Facebook. Uh, which is better, the Galactic Republic, uh, the Old Republic, the New Republic, the Galactic Empire, CIS, etc., etc. And it's kind of something that's always interests me, because I find the political aspects of Star Wars are often kind of underdeveloped. Like, people complain that the... Um, the Phantom Menace and the prequels talk too much about politics, but we don't get a ton of really kind of a sense of how do things work, how much power does the Republic have, how, how is the Confederacy different than the Republic, and you kind of have to dig through a lot of the different books to try and find it and, and, and comb through different things on the internet. So I'm sure I'll get a ton of people going, Argent, that's not true, Argent, that's not accurate. Um, in, in this book, in this book, and I've read a fair number of Extended Universe stuff, I think you just have to keep in mind a lot of this is going to be inaccurate just because there's there's so much material. It's so dense. Every frame is just is just crammed. Okay, well, that, that's referencing the Phantom Menace director's commentary. But there, there's just... It's such a huge Extended Universe. Sometimes it kind of contradicts each other. It's all very complicated... So, that in mind, this video is going to be about me comparing and contrasting kind of the different forms of government in the Star Wars universe, and kind of giving my impression as a political scientist as which ones work, how they work, etc. I'm going to have to, like, fill in the blanks a lot, just because, like I said, there's not a ton of information available on a lot of these. So, that being said, let's begin with the Old Republic. Now, the Old Republic, I think, kind of gets a bad rap, uh, or bad reputation. It's presented in a very negative light in the um, prequel movies. And it, it does seem very kind of weak and effeminate compared to the Empire, which comes after it. Uh, we don't know a ton about the Old Republic, it, at least from the movie standpoint. It's fleshed out a lot more in kind of the, the games that take place during the period. Um, particularly in the Old Republic games, which I think portray the Old Republic in a much more positive light than the new ones. So let's just kind of go into detail about how the, how the whole thing worked. So the Old Republic was a, a, a loose confederation of most of, the, uh, most of the galaxy's civilized worlds, and every planet was more or less allowed to have its own form of government. Uh, some were theocracies, some were monarchies, some were democratic republics. Some were kind of mixed forms of government. Uh, Naboo went from kind of being an absolute monarchy to being kind of a aristocratic elective monarchy where the uh, great houses elected a member from within their ranks to be the king. You had um, places like Geonosis, which were under the rule of a duke. Um, Count Dooku was the, the count of a world. Corellia, I think, is a republic. Sometimes it was a single world. Sometimes it was a group of worlds. Um, but each kind of sovereign entity within the republic was accorded a senate seat. What powers the senate had exactly are somewhat ambiguous. It kind of depends upon the era. Uh, broadly speaking, they kind of have the ability to regulate interplanetary trade, uh, mediate between... Um, Disagreements between different planets, defending the Republic from outside intervention, and, and just kind of a lot of things like that. It's, it's like I said, it's a loose confederation. Um, it, it's hard to kind of think of an example. I guess kind of maybe the Holy Roman Empire during certain periods. They don't really seem to take much of an interest in the eternal, internal um, uh, politics of the various member states, unless they're I think slavery is illegal, but by and large, they're left alone. Um, with regards to the Old Republic, you have to divide it into two eras, the pre and post, uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, Rus and Reformation era. Um, the Rus and Reformation happened about a thousand years before the start of the series, 
where the Jedi's and Republic succeeded in defeating the um, the the Brotherhood of Darkness, which was kind of the last large Sith Order. Uh, the Brotherhood of Darkness is kind of interesting because it was it was kind of an attempt to make an egalitarian Sith order where they, they kind of had tried to eliminate a lot of the infighting that made them constantly lose to the Jedi. But after they were defeated, uh, I think a Senator Valorum, uh, an ancestor of the, the Chancellor at the start of Phantom Menace, passed the Rusin Reformation Act. So that did a whole bunch of stuff. Um, previously, Jedi Order was much more decentralized. Uh, the Jedi were spread out throughout the galaxy. I think there was also a lot more of them. But you had like this, these really based governments where the Jedi who were stationed on specific planets to kind of keep law and order were so beloved by the people there that they were given castles, they were given fiefs. In many cases, the planets just begged the Jedi to take over. And so you had Jedi Lord, which is basically the most based form of government possible. So you had Jedi Lords who ruled over planets as basically feudal fiefs, and they were just kind of spread out throughout the galaxy. Um, the Jedi were a lot more autonomous from the Republican Senate. Um, like I said, they were spread out. Also, I think marriage was more tolerated back then. Uh, Revan got married, and I've seen some other accounts. I think it was a more case-by-case -case basis than a, kind of a blanket rule. So what the Rusin Reformation did was it... Um, abolished the Republic military. Uh, the Republic used to have a, a fairly substantial military. Um, it didn't just shrink it because there was no need to have as big a military now that there was no Sith Empire to have a direct war against. But it eliminated the Republic military. Um, it kind of conscripted the Jedi. It took away most of their autonomy and made them kind of the de facto uh, new uh, the, the new military of the Republic. Um, all the Jedi were basically required to live on Coruscant um, Jedi attachment became much more um, frowned upon. The Jedi became much more, I guess you could say, conservative in their teachings. Um, any kind of experimentation or learning about the Force was actively discouraged, and there was kind of an extremely rigid indoctrination program. Prior to Rusen, the Jedi were happy to accept older Force users. Any Force user could basically become a Jedi, but post Rusin, they would only accept babies, which is probably part of the reason why the Jedi Order shrunk over time and was much smaller, because they were very limited in the people that they could recruit. Um, if they were over a couple of years old, they didn't bother recruiting them anymore. So you had all this stuff. I think a lot of other aspects of the government changed, but over time, I think people tended to lose faith in the Jedi and stop believing in the Force because they just didn't encounter Jedi on a regular basis anymore. All the Jedi Lords were forced were forced to give up their castles, and with the loss of the military, I mean, obviously the Republic doesn't need a massive, all-powerful military, but it did need some sort of military force to, 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 to prevent the Trade Federation and just planets with... If the Republic had no teeth, then it was basically kind of pointless. Um, while it didn't need the kind of all-powerful, massive military of the later Empire... It, it kind of became a paper tiger and a joke uh, near the end of it. So I think Rusin uh, uh, kind of destroyed the Republic, and even though it had a period of prosperity, it, it over time just made it more decadent and corrupt. So then we have the old Sith Empire, which I can't say a ton of because we don't know a ton about how it actually works. Every Sith Empire seems to be completely different and yet extremely similar. Uh, the Sith tend to have a mixture of meritocracy and majocracy, where it's, it's government by force users, but it's also meritocracy in the sense that um, nothing is true, all things are permitted. If you can kill the person above you, you can take their authority and take their, their position, and it's all perfectly legal. Um, the impression we get from the the impression we get from the old Republic games is the Sith Empire was basically ruled by force users who spent most of their time killing one another and practicing magical rituals, and the actual empire was largely run by non-force users. Uh, the Sith, aside from being useful in the army, seemed to have basically been a hindrance to the empire more than a help. Um, their general incompetence, uh, lack of concern for kind of day-to-day -day governance, 
and um, willingness to basically sacrifice the strategic and economic position of the empire for their, their lame power games uh, basically ensured that the empires constantly collapsed into infighting. Even though it was able to summon much more, it, even though it was a much more centralized ordered form of government and could deploy more of its resources relative to the Republic, it just wasn't really stable enough to ever last for a substantial length of time. And so they kept reforming Sith empires, and they kept dying just as quickly. So that's really all we can say about the, the old Sith empire. Uh, a lot of the, the details of day-to-day -day governance are kind of just not there. Okay, next we have the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Uh, the Confederacy of Independent Systems was, was very interesting. Obviously kind of inspired by the Confederacy. They even have the, I think it's... I think it's CSA, yeah, it's Confederate States of America in real life, and it's CIS, Confederacy of Independent Systems, so obviously it's supposed to be similar. It's called the Confederacy, and it, it's breaking away. Um, they even called the um, Army of the Republic form the Grand Army of the Republic, which is what the, um, the Union Army was called, uh, the main Union Army under the command of um, uh, Meade and... McClellan and eventually Grant was called during the the um, American Civil War. So the, the the creation of the Confederacy had a number of different factors behind it. Once it, once again, despite the the unending series of Clone Wars stuff, we really don't know a ton about how the Confederacy worked. My understanding is it was kind of created for a couple different reasons. Uh, the first was general corruption within the um, Senate and ruled by bureaucrats who didn't really understand how things work, so they were passing all kinds of regulations and taxes that hampered commerce. Uh, as you can see from the movies and just other material, the, the Confederacy was largely composed of corporate interests. Now, unlike the real world, corporate interests tended to be states unto themselves. Um, the moon, the moons, moons controlled their own planet. Uh, Camino was its own world, despite being kind of a um, a capitalistic entity. Some of them, like uh, Dooku and, like I said, um, sorry, not Camino. What am I talking about? Uh, Mustafar. Mustafar is where um, no Geonosis. Sorry, jeez, I'm getting all these mixed up. Geonosis uh, was a um, was it was a heiress, was uh, ruled by a duke but at the same time was also kind of a capitalist world. So you had all these worlds that felt uh, disenfranchised. Uh, there's also an undercurrent that isn't really explained, although it's explored a lot in the movie, in the book Darth Plagueis, where over time their uh, Coruscant had developed a real sense of human chauvinism. Uh, that is, while aliens were not excluded, humans disliked them, and the Senate was kind of dominated by human interests. Uh, my understanding is humans were a majority on Coruscant, and Coruscant is, of course, the human homeworld. And humans were the most active in colonizing new planets, and while they would never become a majority, they were a plurality of the Old Republic, um, a large plurality. Uh, whereas a lot of other species maybe only had a system or two, or a world or two, humans had tens of thousands of worlds to their name. If you look at the Confederacy, the, it, it had a vast majority of the population that were non-human. Um, a lot of near-humans and a lot of just complete uh, species unrelated to, to humans. So I think a lot of it has to do with resentment against the way that they were being treated by the human-centric uh, republic. And um, we can see this in Palpatine. Palpatine was kind of a xenophobe, and I use that term unironically, um, and he really despised aliens. And that's kind of an attitude very um, common among nobility and kind of the elites within the core worlds, uh, within kind of the the, the wealthiest, uh, oldest worlds of the Republic. So I think there was a lot of dislike of that um, alienation combined with what they felt were taxes and regulations that were being placed upon them because they were non-human and just a general dis and just a general dissatisfaction with the um, state of the republic. There's also the issue that with lacking any sort of armed forces, 
there's not a great deal the Republic could could take uh, could do to stop them from uh, leaving. So what wound up happening is they seceded and they formed the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Uh, much like in real life, the Confederacy had their own Senate. Uh, they had their own Executive Council. I think all the uh, senators for the systems who had served during the Republic just became separatist senators. They had their own army, their own bureaucracy. Because they had a lot better technology, a lot more industry, but a much lower population, they relied very heavily on droids. Um, people like to make a big deal about how it was controlled by the Sith, but by and large, uh, Dooku and Darth Thrawn, uh, uh, a.k.a. Darth Thrawn, has just kind of controlled it as a normal head of state. Uh, I don't think he ever had a title other than head of state. He was never like chancellor or president or anything like that. And after he died, General Grievous merely took the title head of state. Um, with, the actual position of Sith within it is, I'm not really sure, because there were a lot of dark side add-ups. I don't think that the average person really knew much about it. So overall, I think you can describe the Confederacy as, as being similar to how the Republic was back in kind of its heyday pre uh but more decentralized and with more of a focus on mercantile interests just be, and um, non-human interests um, in, in contrast to uh, Republic. So I, I like the Confederacy. I have a lot of time for the Confederacy. I think in a lot of cases it was just a dissatisfaction to the um, the post rusin era. And in Darth Plagueis, it's talked a lot about how they actively kind of pushed in that direction, but I think it was moving in that direction anyways. It's kind of a cop-out to just say that Palpatine and Plagueis and the Sith did everything without considering that to a large extent they were exasperating, uh, exasperating underlying trends. Finally, a system of government we know a lot about, uh, the Galactic Empire. I think the thing you have to keep in mind about the Galactic Empire is its name is kind of misleading. While it was a monarchy, in, in truth it was much more of a fascist state. And, and I mean that unironically, I mean that in terms of doctrinal fascism. While there were a lot of what we would kind of call rightist elements to it, a uh, hierarchy, um, a police state, nationalism, um, patriarchy, xenophobia, kind of a lot of stuff like that. At the same time, the there was a lot of progressive elements to the empire as well. Uh, the embrace of standardization, minimalist architecture, uh, a general disdain for for tradition, uh, for for aspects of the past. Really, it was kind of an attempt to kind of build the new man, uh, to build the new society. It was it was an attempt to completely break with the past and start with something new. And there's a lot of, I guess, kind of more direct references to fascism. You have the ideology was the New Order, which is more or less what most fascist states kind of name their official ideology. Uh, it was a one-party state. The only real legal political party was the, uh, I can't remember what the acronym was, but it's Commission for the Preservation of the New Order, which was a political party that imperial citizens were encouraged to join. And it, it's kind of like the SA and the SS and the uh, Nazi party all in one. And it was dedicated to the promotion and maintenance of the new order. And members of it were expected to engage in patriotic duties. They were given priority, um, better ranks if they joined the imperial military. Uh, it prepared them for positions in the civil service. And there was a number of privileges you got from for joining the commission for the preservation of the new order. And they had their own military force and their own secret police force, although much less professional than the Imperial Army was. So let's talk about the New Order for the, for a minute. The, the New Order is, like I said, it's a fascist ideology because there's kind of rightist aspects to it, but there's also a lot of kind of progressive aspects to it. One of the main tenets of the New Order that I think is kind of overlooked is human supremacy or human centrism. If you notice in the Star Wars movies, there's very few, if no, al to no aliens who serve in the Imperial military. It's pretty much all humans. Palpatine was deeply xenophobic when he was younger, uh, despite working with Darth Plagueis. 
but he didn't like non-humans, seeing them as uncultured, barbaric, and regressive. And this was kind of an attitude very common on Coruscant and planets like Naboo. They just didn't like non-humans. And this transferred over to the Galactic Empire. Uh, human supremacy was seen as a just a natural given. There was a development of a movement called the Human High Culture, which was kind of human chauvinism that viewed humans as the only species capable of creating proper culture. Uh, to a certain extent, there was near-human supremacism. Uh, near-humans are a variety of races. Oh, I can't remember them. The race that's blind but can see through the Force. Uh, the Night Sister race, I forget what they're called. Uh, Iridonians. Basically, any race in Star Wars that basically looks human but is a little weird is new human. And they were largely accepted. Uh, the Chiss are also a near-human race. Uh, Thrawn being the only near human to ever attain the rank of Grand Admiral. But, yeah, there was that aspect to it. Uh, there was also, like I said, a desire to destroy the past. Uh, Palpatine despised traditional architecture, preferring minimalism. I believe they adopted a new language and a new style of writing, and they, re they completely reformed the economy and made it a lot more centralized than it had been previously. The government of the of the empire was also very different. Um, it was much more. It was kind of interesting because it's more centralized and less centralized than it had been previously. The empire was given over to moths, which were basically local warlords. Uh, they were given dominion over a a sector, which I think is a couple dozen worlds to a couple hundred worlds, depending on the rank of the moth. And each moth had their own army. They had their own battle fleets. In some cases, they had their own super star destroyers or access to some of the other super weapons. And they were basically just kind of given authority to run the, the district and, and up with a great deal of autonomy. In, in contrast to kind of how the, the Republic ran, it was mainly like one or two planets. The difference being a moth could raise a substantial army and go on the offensive, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the Moths had far larger forces under their control than the individual planets did in the past. Uh, the Senate was gradually done away with, and more and more they, they moved towards a bureaucracy. There's a couple different ways to run a society. Uh, feudalism and decentralization is one. If you're going to have a centralized state, you normally need a strong central military and a bureaucracy to take over kind of the governmental duties, which is kind of like how the Byzantine Empire and some more kind of old school centralized states were run. Um, so they built the Starfleet and the, um, the a huge uh, army under the direct command of Coruscant to kind of counterbalance the power of the Moths. So not only did Palpatine restore the army, uh, the galactic army, so to speak, but he massively expanded it. And the Empire poured massive amounts of resources into the creation of super weapons, um, continually building new and updated ships. Was there a purpose to all of this? Not really, to be perfectly honest. Um, by the time A New Hope happens, the Empire has a fleet hundreds if not thousands of times larger than anything the Republic, uh, I mean, sorry, the Rebel Alliance could possibly field. Um, ships like the Death Star are completely useless as a super star destroyer, sorry, a star destroyer is quite capable of bombarding a planet into, of glassing a planet by itself, or they could just use nuclear weapons. Uh, there's no real need or reason to have a super laser that can blow up a planet. It's just excessive. They also built like stuff like the Sun Crusher, whatever that giant asteroid thing was, and they were just all kind of a complete waste of time and money. <coughs> kind of the big issue with the Empire, and I think the thing you have to understand about it, is it's, it's a lot like a lot of historical empires, which are very much dependent upon a man of exceptional talents to run them. Alexander was able to conquer the world, but when he died, his empire rapidly fell apart and just lost all of its... Um, strength that had a infighting between his successors for the next hundred, couple hundred years. Um, you had that, then you also had, uh, I'm trying to remember what the other example was I had in my, oh yeah, Justinian's Empire. 
Uh, Justinian reconquered large parts of the old Roman Empire. Uh, he completely reformed the legal system. He built, had massive construction projects. He did religious reforms. Uh, Justinian was an extremely energetic um, and competent leader who utterly transformed Byzantine society and brought it to great heights. The problem was, uh, problem was um, the expenditures in terms of men and material were massive. And while a man of Justinian's ta uh, in amazing talents could manage it, as soon as he died and the lesser man replaced him, the whole thing just kind of fell apart almost immediately. Uh, there's other examples of this. The Roman emperors near the end, like Majorian, who were competent and, and did stand a real chance of restoring large portions of the empire, and never in, invariably died, and their replacements uh, squandered whatever they were able to get. So I think that's what you have to understand about the Galactic Empire. Uh, the Galactic Empire, while, while very functional, it required a leader of, of immense skill and immense manipulation to keep everybody in line. You had all these, um, these powerful moths, all these powerful warlords. You had a massive fleet. You had super weapons everywhere. And so long as Palpatine was in control, that the Imperial fleet was completely loyal to him and able to destroy any sign of rebellion. Uh, so long as he, as all the um, politicians and, like I said, warlords lived in fear, things functioned pretty well. Uh, the ideology existed to support him. But as soon as Palpatine died, everything fell apart. I think we have to keep in mind, though, as Palpatine intended to live forever. He had a series of clones. He would just keep moving his consciousness from clone to clone, and the Empire would forever be run by him. So it was set up in that fashion. When he did wind up dying, though, the various Grand Admirals, uh, Moffs, and other figures who had been given so much autonomy and, and firepower immediately turned on one another and began fighting for supremacy. Uh, you had Imperial Intelligence, the Commission for the First Order, uh, for the preservation of the new order. You had all these these different factions immediately fighting one another. Had had um, the Empire retained any ass element of unity, it could have utterly destroyed the New Republic. Uh, you had a couple things like in, during the events of Dark Empire, uh, I cannot pronounce his name, Zringi? Zingdu? Zingji? whatever his name was, uh, managed to basically beat the shit out of the New Republic before he died in a typical Star Wars fashion. You had Isard. Basically, if any of these people had managed to pull the Empire back together, they had thousands of times the firepower of the, um, the New Republic. But they continued to fight even into the Dala era, and they just continued to slaughter one another. And the New Republic basically won by default. Because as poorly run as it was, it was not as poorly run as the Imperial successor state. We know absolutely nothing about the First Order. I couldn't find any information on it. From, from what I understand, it was the successor to the Empire. After the defeated Endor, surviving remnants of the Empire fled into the unknown regions and rebuilt themselves. Now, I, I never get this whenever people go, oh, the Empire fled into the Unknown Regions, because that implies like they have to hide from the New Republic. The Empire, if it had retained any form of unity, had, like I said, thousands or tens of thousands of times the firepower. So I'm guessing the First Order was a, a fairly small group of moths and maybe a Grand Admiral or two who saw the writing on the wall and took their fleets and decided to flee the, the constant civil war and kind of regroup. Um, I imagine I imagine the majority of the Empire's old weapon systems and ships destroyed each other in a series of civil wars. Uh, we know nothing about the New Republic or how big the New Republic fleet is, but my guess is the First Order has a large number of systems beyond the rim, maybe not as large as the, um, the uh, New Republic is, but certainly a, a quite powerful force to be reckoned with. Who Grand Leader Snooki, Snooki is, I have no idea who Snooki is. He's obviously an alien. Why an organization that worships the Empire has an alien as its leader is completely mysterious. Uh, how the government works is completely mysterious. It appears to be some sort of spritocracy uh, where military rank 
and civilian rank are the same thing. We have absolutely no idea. It's from a movie I don't even really consider canon. I just thought I'd mention it. Just briefly, I figured I'd uh, mention The Empire of the Hand. I don't know enough about the the Fell Empire or the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances or any of that stuff. But The Empire of the Hand was a state formed by Thrawn when he was sent by Palpatine to subdue some of the unknown regions. The Empire of the Hand, with its capital on... Uh, I forget what the Chiss homeworld is called, but um, when Thrawn came to power over the Empire, he dramatically reformed it. Uh, he got rid of human centrism. I think it kept, though, the uh, patriarchy aspects of it. He got rid of human centrism. Uh, the Imperial Army was opened up to non-humans. But, and um, a lot of the sadistic, kind of totalitarian aspects of the Empire went away. Uh, he made it more of a meritocracy. He made it more of a society committed to order and stability. And... Um, I guess you could say just people working together for the greater good than Palpatine, who had kind of run the Empire in a lot of cases as a sadist. Uh, people loved Thrawn and were willing to die for him. No one loves Palpatine. People feared him. People feared, respected, and loved Thrawn, though. And he ran a much more just, much more rational state. Unfortunately, because we aren't allowed to sympathize with that sort of thing, he was killed off. Um, I forgot to mention, but the... Um, the Empire, part of the New Order, was human supremacy. Uh, not only human supremacy, but uh, human and um, male... It was, it was patriarchy, which I think is kind of the main thing it approved upon, because I believe in patriarchy. Finally, we have the New Republic, and how shitty it is is pretty well summed up by this, this piece of crap flag. <laughs> it looks awful. So, the New Republic, I don't know a ton about, not because of lack of, of looking. I, I've read a bunch of books from this era, but it just seems like a shitty version of the, uh, the Old Republic. Uh, in contrast to the Old Republic, it seems much more liberal. Um, it's, it's kind of a lot more like, I guess, kind of a modern liberal democracy. The Old Republic was kind of more of an oligarchy, kind of more of a traditional aristocratic thing. In this case, it seems like open preference is given towards democratic republics. Um, it's, it's still very decentralized, but it also has an army, which is kind of weird. So you had like civil wars happening and planets attacking one another uh, during the events of uh, the Thrawn trilogy, but the central government seemed completely unwilling or incapable of dealing with it, even as their armies were rampaging across the galaxy. Um, the New Republic just appears to be a completely unstable state uh, that simultaneously has a huge navy while lacking in any ability to control uh, the disparate populations contained within it. Um, the New Republic is, is frankly kind of a disastrous state. It, it lacks kind of all the things that made the Old Republic interesting, all the things that kind of made it function. Uh, the New Jedi Order lacks all the traditions of the old Jedi Order. They even got rid of uh, the, the whatever it is, the seven traditional forms of lightsaber combat and, and introduced a, a, a light, medium, and heavy style. Basically, they just it, it really just has nothing to do with the Old Republic other than the name. It doesn't really make an attempt to imitate the decentralized uh, nature of it. Um, it's just a lot more weak, like I said. It lacks kind of the patriotism. It lacks kind of the sense of identity. And in the Old Republic games, uh, you have a, an army that where there's a strong sense of patriotism, duty, a sense of idealism among a lot of the soldiers, and a willingness to die, um, and a willingness of, of generation upon generation to sacrifice themselves to preserve civilization and to preserve freedom and, and order. Uh, the New Republic just, like I said, seems like a generic liberal democracy. It kind of reminds me of the EU. It's, it's a postmodern, post-galactic state in which there's nothing to live for and nothing to die for. And I despised it. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to, to express it just because it's so bland. The Old Republic had flavor. It had an architectural style. It had its traditions. It had just all this history the new republic is just a completely artificial rationally constructed thing 
that lacks even the character, the minimalist character of the Galactic Empire. Um, it's it's like I said, it's kind of hard to describe why I despise it so much, but it's it's you know what it is? It's based civic. No, it's not even based civic nationalism. That's kind of more like what the the Empire was. No, that was ethnic nationalism, but. So that's the various government forms in Star Wars. I hope you enjoyed this. Sorry the video was so long. Uh, keep, uh, keep attentive. More content to come.